Good morning everyone. Thank you Essence Patranditta unit for giving me yet another wonderful opportunity to present a topic and this time I am coming with a topic named Artemis. The humanity's return to the moon. Well, the name Artemis, it means the Greek goddess of the moon. So, we know well about the Apollo missions, right? Apollo missions that you know, the first time the man went to moon during the years 1969 to 1972. And the Artemis, the name, it's actually the twin sister of the god Apollo. So here, after a long time, like say 50 plus years, we are going back to the moon. And this time we have different objectives. So the views of the blue marble in the blackness of space, captures the imagination of a new generation. Welcome to the Artemis generation. So the main mission objective is of NASA is to take the first woman to the moon and the first man of color because the previous missions, that means the lunar missions, were the astronauts went to moon, they all were white people. Now this time, they are taking a woman to the moon and a man of color. So that's the difference between the Apollo missions and the Artemis mission in the first glance itself. Now, the second difference is that NASA will be collaborating with the commercial and international partners. There are several international partners coming up now like Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, etc. So this will be like a collaboration and it's like an international mission, not just an American mission. So that's the real difference compared to the Apollo missions. Now what are we going to do after going to the moon after 50 plus years? Are we going to do the same set of experiments? The answer is no, because this time we are not just planning to go to the moon, but we are also planning to go to the planet Mars. So the moon will behave like an interplanetary hub. And that's exactly why we are going back to the moon. And here you can see all the 12 astronauts who have gone to the moon. Now, well, we might be knowing only one just name, Neil Armstrong, right? That's the name that will be coming into our mind whenever, um, you know, something is asked about the first man on moon. This is the only name that comes into our mind, Neil Armstrong. But remember, in the first Apollo 11 mission, it's not just one person who stepped foot on the moon, but two people. Not just Neil Armstrong, but Edwin Aldrin too. Now you can see all the 12 astronauts in this picture and the Saturn V rocket who helped I mean, which helped them to take to the moon. Now, the primary mission of the Apollo is to place the first humans on the lunar surface. It was due to completely due to political reasons. Well, we know that because after the Second World War, the Cold War started between the USSR and USA. So they were trying to show their weaponary power or their advanced technologies. But... We know that what happened at that time, the space race, well, USSR was completely dominating that field. The first man in space, the first satellite, the first woman in space, the first animal, it was all one name, Russia. USA was not even the close at that time. And that's exactly in the year 1961. John F. Kennedy decided, okay, now it's time to stop this and it's time for the USA to come back and hit hard. But this time we'll take man to the moon. And he declared at, in that year that we are going to take the man to the moon. And they achieved it not just once. That's something that you need to note. It's not just one single mission. They have done it six times through the missions Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 70. Like the 12 astronauts okay, went to moon. Unfortunately, Apollo 13 was not a successful mission, but there were no casualties. They came back to Earth 
completely safely, but there was an oxygen tank explosion. Even though USA has pioneered the landing on the moon several times, there are many people still not believing that NASA has taken moon to them, a man to the moon. And almost 20 percentage of the US citizens itself, they are not believing that they have gone to the moon. It's so unfortunate, isn't it? And they have presented hundreds and lakhs of evidences. But still, there are so many people supporting that, that humans have not gone to the moon. There are people still out there between us itself, believing that the earth is flat and the moon landing is faked. And we know that. Who are they, right? Well, we can't do anything about that, right? Because it's not our duty to go behind each of them and make them believe that science has achieved all these pinnacles. So, it's not possible. You can see the history of lunar exploration in this diagram or in this picture. The Saturn V, the then powerful rocket, it, it launched in the, uh, the, it helped the man to reach the moon in the year 1969 until 1972. USA comfortably achieved that pinnacle, that taking man to the moon, followed after that China, USSR, India and Japan has soft landed on the lunar surface. Now you can see that China is planning to take their men to moon in the year, I mean, I mean in 2030s and Russia by 2040s. The European Space Agency is planning to create a moon village like a township on the surface of the moon. Just imagine that, a township on the surface of the moon. How cool it will be. Now, SpaceX and other international private agencies are planning to go themselves to moon and to Mars. Now, the question is, why are we going back to the moon? What's the big deal in it? I mean, what's so attractive there? Well, we have done that several times. Now, why we are going back to the moon again? What's, you know, after 50 years, what is there waiting for us? The first reason is the prestige and the geopolitics. Because it's been a lot of pressure for, uh, you know, not just for USA, but for all other countries. Why people are not going back to the moon even after 50 plus years? The second is, its moon means it's not just a natural satellite, but a hub of natural resources, especially titanium and helium-3, because helium-3 is a good resource for nuclear fusion process. Now, nuclear fusion, we haven't made a fusion power plant yet, but still in the future, we might create one, and at that time, the best ingredient for nuclear fusion is helium-3, and that we can mine from the surface of the moon. Now, you can also keep telescopes on the surface of the moon and it will give a clear vision of the night sky because the terrestrial telescope on the surface of the earth won't give you a clear picture of the, of the night sky because of the atmosphere. Atmosphere will behave like an obstruction and you won't get a clear picture but on the surface of the moon there is no atmosphere so we get a clear picture. Now, space tourism, just imagine after maybe one or two generations, your grandchildren, you know, going to the surface of the moon like a college trip. Maybe we can expect that, right? At least they might be orbiting around the moon and coming back. So that's possible. Now, when I say all these things, we might wonder, how is this going to happen? Well, space tourism has already started. You should know that. And the ultimate aim, it's not go to the moon, as I already said before, it's Mars. That's, you know, what we are waiting for. We'll be colonizing the planet Mars. Now, what are the key obstacles to build a moon base? Imagine you are going to the moon. And now, what are the main problems that you are going to face there? Number one is the drastic temperature changes. We know that the a lunar day lasts up to 29 days and the temperature rises up to you know, 117 degrees Celsius during the 
morning time and during the night time it will go down to minus 169 degrees Celsius. So somehow we need to manage that temperature change. After that the gravity is only the one sixth the gravity of the earth. So we need to handle that thing. Gravity is a main problem. There is no indigenous water. You, you won't get water just like that we get on the surface of the earth because water you can see it only in the form of solid ice and in the hydroxyl format. The distance between the moon and earth is not just 1000 or 10,000 kilometers, it is 3,80,000 plus kilometers far away. So it's so far away. Landing on the moon is difficult than landing on Mars is another hurdle that we need to face. Well, there is no atmosphere, so we need to somehow face the cosmic radiations. So that is another problem, the radiations. We need to, the exposure, to, uh, the radiation exposure, somehow we need to manage that. And finally, the cost. It's extremely cost, costly to go back to the moon. It, the Artemis missions itself is nearly 1,25,000 crore rupees for the three missions. So these are the key obstacles that we will face. Now, yes, we have learned a lot of things from the Apollo missions. There is no doubt in that. We know how to carry the entire computers in the palm of our hands. The technology has changed. We know currently that there is water ice on the, at the poles of the lunar surface and water is definitely an essential thing for life, isn't it? It is also a fuel because you can split H2 into hydrogen and oxygen and there you get hydrogen, you can use it as a fuel. It helps us grow food. Maybe we can use hydroponics there. Now other precious minerals are like, you know, titanium, helium-3 as I said already, phosphorus, potassium, all these things are available on the surface of the moon. And all these materials are currently in high demand and for digital technology such as computer circuits or mobile phone chips. Now, Project Artemis, the main difference, I already mentioned that. This time a woman is going to the surface of the moon and a first man of color. Well, they have already decided the astronauts for the Artemis 2 mission because we have successfully completed Artemis 1. Reminding you that we have done that already in the year 2022. That's done. Now, this, that was an uncrewed mission. And in the next year, we'll be going uh, to the moon, but not to land, but we'll be orbiting around the moon and we'll be coming back to the Earth safely. So, we have several plans. It's not just like, you know, deciding one fine day to go to moon and then build a rocket and go to the earth because the objectives have changed, the technology has changed, we need to change accordingly. Now, regarding the rocket, we know that Apollo mission, um, the key thing that helped the Apollo mission is the Saturn V rocket, but this time the rocket has changed. It's called as Space Launch System. The name of the rocket is Space Launch System. It's one of the most powerful rocket has been ever built. It's flying under 25 engines and it can hit a speed up to 17,000 miles per hour. Well, NASA hopes to use this rocket to fly humans not just to moon but to Mars as well as to deep space. It can carry people not just to moon but to Mars as well as in deep space. It's the first big mission to take the astronauts to the moon in 2024, but the date has changed. Now it will be 2025. Now remember, Artemis, initially it's a three-staged mission. The first mission, we have successfully completed that. It's called Artemis 1, an uncrewed mission. Artemis 2, we will be launching in the next year. That will be a crewed mission with four astronauts. One will be a woman. The, uh, one will be a man of color and the other two will be uh, the mission commander and a, a flight specialist. Now Artemis 3 is the mission that we are expecting uh, to be launched in the year 2026 and at that time we'll be landing on the moon not just to you know collect some lunar soil back to the rocket and come back to the earth but this time we'll be settling there for at least four days. So we will be staying on the lunar surface for four days. Now, after that, 
atom is 5, 6, 7 may be there and will be colonizing the surface of the moon. Well, you can see the comparison between the sizes of Artemis rockets, which is SLS and Saturn V. Well, clearly, SLS rocket, height-wise, it is lesser than that of the Saturn V, no doubt in that, but it's so powerful than Saturn V rocket. The iconic space shuttle you can see on the same picture, it's very small, but still it can carry up to, say, plus 22 plus tons into the lower Earth orbit, well, where SLS can take more than 27 tons to lunar orbit. It's taller than the Statue of Liberty. SLS will produce 13% more thrust at launch than the Space Shuttle and 15% more than the Saturn V. Just imagine that the power that SLS rocket will be releasing during the launch time. You can see, you can see how much weight or payload it can carry to the lunar orbit by SLS. Clearly it dominates, there is no doubt in it. You can see the picture of SLS to the left. Now this is the heart or we can say the brain of the SLS rocket, the engine, the RS-25 engine that literally powers it and you know it can take you up to a speed of 13 times the speed of the sound. It's fast enough to travel from Los Angeles to New York City in just 15 minutes. And this rocket engine is not just built in one place, it's built at several places nearly all across the USA and been assembled at one place and brought to the launch pad. You can see how complicated that engine is. Well, you can also see that the temperature of that engine ranges from minus 423 degree Fahrenheit to 6,000 degree Fahrenheit. Look at that temperature variation. It has to handle this temperature variation. Now this is the solid rocket boosters which will help the rocket to escape the Earth's gravity. The solid rocket booster alone is taller than Statue of Liberty. You can see how powerful and fast it is. Now this is the core part of the rocket which is called as the core stage and it contains liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, supposed to be the biggest core stage of any rocket that you can see on the Earth's surface. Now you can see that nearly 63 large tanker trucks are required to fill that core stage uh, with fuel. And this is the main part. That means once the solid rocket boosters are done with its burning and then after the core stage burning now this is the exploration upper stage which will take that crew module that is where the astronauts you know do all their operations right and this exploration upper stage will take their crew to the lunar orbit as simple as that you can see two engines here two basically you can see two machines here on the left you can see the ICPS, it's called as ICPS, to the right is called as Exploration Upper Stage. The first one they have already used for Artemis 1 mission. And the second one is what we are going to use for Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 missions. Now look at that crew module. Such a beautiful thing. This is the Orion Space Module or Crew Module. And behind that you can see the Service Module. Now, if you do remember, like if you have ever seen the videos of Apollo missions, you can see the astronauts controlling so many switches, turning on this, turning off that, looking at a book and reading it, making sure that everything is fine because one switch, if you turn it off uh, by mistake, then it could lead to a huge problem. But this time, it's completely dealt by artificial intelligence. We have a lot of touch screens inside that crew module. Now astronauts literally need to enjoy their you know, uh, space travel. That's all what they need to do. There will be only a few things that they need to do this time because everything will be controlled by the computer intelligence and they have everything as touch screens. It's completely electrical and you can see the service module be behind that Orion crew module which will provide the electricity from the solar panels as well as the necessary things like the logistics and the food and all other things. So this is the Orion crew module. 
And this time, the crew module is, you know, fit with many other things. Like, it's very large in diameter. There is a lot of room inside the Orion crew module. The Apollo Eagle module was very difficult for the astronauts to, you know, sit inside. And But this time, it's not like that. There is room for at least four people. And it has an updated thermal protection system. And it has got radiation monitoring systems. It will recycle the water and reuse, similarly to that of Apollo, but better than that of Apollo. It can last up to 21 days. I mean, it can hold the life or it can support the life for 21 days. And it has got a new parachute system. And the module is combined with retro rockets and airbags for capsule recovery. Because in the Apollo mission, there was no capsule recovery system because once it falls onto the surface of the ocean after a few, you know, few minutes, like say after 20, 30 minutes, it starts sinking down the ocean. So there were a lot of ships, flights, helicopters, you know, literally roaming around the Pacific Ocean searching for the Apollo's, you know, uh, crew module. But this time, it's not necessary. I mean, so many ships and flights are not required to, uh, uh, to collect that crew module because it will be floating on the surface of the ocean comfortably without any problem. So that is the Orion crew module. Now here you can see the different rockets they are, they are going to launch. The first one we already launched in the Artemis 1 mission and you can see the size comparison and the payload comparison that it can carry. Every single rocket is powerful than that of the previous one. Towards right you can see it can carry more and more payloads. Now, this, these are the information regarding the, the Artemis 1. We launched it in the year 16 November 2022 and it came back after 25 days, 11th December 2022. We launched from the John F. Kennedy Space Center and uh, the mission duration is 25 days, 10 hours, 55 minutes to be precise. Now, this is the trajectory of the Artemis 1 and in this trajectory you can see it's very complicated the trajectory it's not like Apollo trajectory Apollo trajectory was much more simpler than that of the Artemis and this time it's not like that we have several other objectives and that's exactly why you see trajectories like this so after the launch the solid boosters will disconnect or will get separated then the intercourse stage will start burning and once it is done then the ICPS helped the Artemis 1 rocket to push to the lunar orbit during the trip, it deployed some 13 cube satellites for various experiments and measurements. So, let me show you a quick, very small video of how it happened. So this is the launch of the SLS rocket. Once it escapes the Earth's gravity, it disconnects the solid booster rockets. Then the intercourse stage will start burning, its flaps will di get disconnected, the nose of the rocket will get deployed. Because there is no more atmosphere, you don't need the extra weight to be carried. Once the intercourse stage is done, now it will disconnect. Now the ICPS will start to turn on and ICPS will help the service module and crew module to take the lunar trajectory. You can see the solar panels getting deployed to generate the electricity for the Orion crew module. It's such a complicated thing, it's not easy as we see. And that one final burn of ICPS will help it to take it to the lunar orbit. So this is the launch part. And you can see the crew module along with the service module going around the moon and the cube satellites, you can see small, small boxes coming out. Those are the cube satellites. So that is the launch part. Well, that is regarding the Artemis 1. The Artemis 2, we have got a finer trajectory because the only 
time that we can spend in there have planned to spend is only 10 days it's not a 25 day mission this is a 10 day mission because it's a crude mission so that's why they have reduced the time to 10 days and the lift off will be as similar as that of the artemis 1 and artemis 2 will make sure to leave the earth as soon as possible to prevent the crew from flying too much time inside the van allen bells and what do you mean by Van Allen Belt? I will show you that after one more slide. But this is the crew that NASA has announced for the Artemis 2 mission. Well, you can see the person who is sitting. Don't forget these names because they, it's going to be the part of the history. The Commander Raid Wiseman, who is sitting at the bottom. Behind him, the person of the first man of color, the pilot, the Victor J. Glover. The mission specialist, the first woman who is going to moon is Christina Koch to the towards the left and towards the right is the first Canadian because it, this is not a NASA mission, this is an international mission and he is Jeremy Hansen. So these are the four astronauts who have been selected to go to moon, to orbit the moon and come back to the earth and they will be going in the next year. Now this is Van Allen Bell. So many students used to ask me like, why the astronauts are not getting cancerous if there is a powerful radiation belt around the Earth's surface? Now, every time they go to the moon, they need to cross this Van Allen belt. So why aren't they getting cancerous? So, that, so does that mean that they haven't gone to the moon? That's the question that students used to pose. So the answer for that is, yes, Van Allen belt consists of powerful radiation. There is no doubt in that. But the time that you are getting exposed in that belt is only less than two hours. Well, to get cancerous, you need to at least spend a time of 10 hours or more. So, this belt is like a two-ring shaped area around the earth where high concentrations of radiation can be dangerous for living beings and that's exactly why we have deployed the geostationary satellites outside the Van Allen belt and not inside. Okay, so the Orion spacecraft has double layer of aluminum filled with Kevlar. So definitely it has got a protection, but still a small amount of radiation may still reach the astronauts. However, they are very mild doses of radiation. If a human receives it for a very long period, then definitely it can cause cancer or a plastic anemia over the years. So we will be spending only two hours or less than that. So it's absolutely safe and not a single person out of the 12 astronauts who have gone to the moon before have got cancer till now. Now, another interesting thing you can see is a gateway. So in order to land on the moon, you can't simply fly a rocket and land just like that. You need to build a space station in the orbit of the moon. Just like the International Space Station, which is orbiting around the Earth at 400 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, you need to first build a space station, which is called as the Gateway. Now, that's so interesting, right? Because this Gateway has basically four main, main units. The first one is the power and propulsion element, which will be powering the entire unit. The housing and logistics outpost, which is basically the crew cabin of astronauts. It provides the basic life support needs for visiting astronauts, preparing to descend to the lunar surface, everything will be done by the second unit. The third part is the deep space logistics. It carries the critical cargo, scientific experiments and supplies, such as sample collection of materials and other items. The final part of this gateway is human landing system, which I will show you in the upcoming slide. So this is gateway. So if you are planning to go to Mars, again we need a space station around the surface of the Mars because we can't simply go in a rocket and land there. That's not our plan because um, we need to build something like this so that we can ascend and descend several times. And this is what NASA is planning to build around the surface of the, I mean, around the lunar orbit with the help of other space agencies, including the private agencies. Now, this is the Artemis 3 mission uh, trajectory. Um, and, well, we are planning to land on the moon in the year 2026, most probably, if everything goes right. So, this is the trajectory of Artemis 3 mission. Now, this is the human landing system, which is the fourth part, which I said just before, in the gateway. Now, several 
private agencies, you know, submitted their plans to NASA and NASA selected the human landing system of SpaceX, the middle one. So SpaceX will be helping to take man to the moon. It, it will be helping to, uh, uh, it will be helping the people to disconnect from the gateway and land on the moon using the human landing system where you can see the human landing systems of other private companies but NASA selected finally of that of the SpaceX. Now the question is we already explained why we are planning to settle on moon, right? We have discovered that large reserves of frozen water, isn't it, exist in the large cold and deep craters of the polar regions. There are smaller, shallower depressions that could retain moisture for thousands of millions of years. That means there are places on the lunar surface still the light hasn't fallen yet because the tilt of the moon is only 5 degrees. Not just, not uh, the earth, in the earth case it is 23 degrees. So almost every place at least the sunlight has fallen but moon is different. So this time we are going back to moon to make history. The astronauts will be divided into two pairs. Like mean, That means four astronauts will be going. They will be split into two pairs. Two will be inside the gateway and they will be monitoring the entire mission. The two others will be landing on the surface of the moon. And not just landing, they will be staying also. Please remember that. Now, the extra vehicular missions. So, okay, the two astronauts landed on the moon and what will they do now? Will they do the same set of experiments that they did in Apollo? Definitely not. So this time they will, first thing they will do is that they will collect at least 35 kilogram of lunar samples. The second thing is they will install the ground monitoring and survey systems to better, for better analysis of the moon soil. The third mission it will be like the search for deposit of water or ice in a lunar craters. And the fourth objective is they carry out the expeditions to define an area in which to establish a lunar base. So you, you, you might be wondering why you need people to do all these things. Why can't we do these things using a robot? So that is where the answer lies. We are going to colonize. We need, it's not just things to be done with the uh, robot because we are not to meant to die on the surface of the earth. At least, yeah, we are born here, but not meant to die on the surface of the Earth. Maybe we might be dying on the surface of planet Mars or Moon or maybe other natural satellites of any other planet. Well, this is the most modern spacesuit that they are going to wear. It will be costing crores, but it's not like the Apollo spacesuit. The name of this spacesuit is called as the Extravehicular Exploration Mobility Unit. It's like an Iron Man suit, you know. There are so many things that you can do with this spacesuit. This time it is designed for good mobility because in the Apollo missions, the astronauts were finding very difficult to walk on the surface of the moon. They were literally hopping and jumping. But this time you can literally walk. These supersuits contain helmets, okay, which are equipped with greater visibility of the environment and it can perform very complicated tasks. It's already presented by NASA, officially presented by NASA. And on the final day of the mission that I already told that it's, they are planning to settle for four days and then they will come back. On the fourth day of their mission, the astronauts carry out some cleaning activities. It's very important. You can't simply keep the tools here and there because when the next Artemis mission land, these tools can fly around and it can cause damage to the um, human landing system. So they need to do the cleaning activities and they make sure to fasten all the equipments well to the ground and take all the tools back once the exploration is done. So all these things they need to do that. Once they do that, this human landing system will ascend from the lunar surface, will get docked to the gateway and they will meet the already two people who are staying there in the gateway and together all four will be coming back to the earth's surface and after they make a safe return to the earth. So that's their plan of Artemis 3. Now as I said the final plan is Mars. Moon is just an interplanetary hub. Mars is actually not the closest planet. We know that it's Venus but why we are not going to the Venus? What could be the reason? The temperature. 
the extreme surface temperature of Venus due to the greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide and all. So we can't stay on the surface of the Venus. Well, maybe we might be able to hover at say some 50 to 80 kilometers from the surface of Venus because it is close, it, the, that temperature is close to the temperature of the Earth, say some 50 to 80 kilometers from the surface. But uh, we will be planning Mars first. The average trip to Mars will last at least half an year. So you need to know somehow psychologically uh, dwell with the other astronauts during the mission. It's not easy. The ships will have to be equipped, equ equipped with all the uh, equipment and supplies and the future we need to build a gateway for Mars too. Well, I have said that. So this is the landing part of the uh, um, Artemis 3 mission. So this is how it looks like. So after orbiting the moon, you can see that the European service module will decouple from the Orion spacecraft. It uses the retro thrusters and it will be entering into the Earth's atmosphere and it will phase a temperature close to half the temperature of the surface of the sun. The speed will be nearly from 20,000 km per hour and it uses the new parachute system and it reduces the speed to 3 km per hour. You can see that beautiful 3 parachutes and eventually splashdown occurs. Remember this time it won't sink. Okay, so finally let me conclude with one point that moon is not just a place for scientists and engineers to work. It's a place for people to live, to raise a family. Once this transition happens, the colony grows rapidly. They might develop crops that efficiently recycle the carbon dioxide. They might find ways to recycle and reuse 100% of their waste, including the human waste. They could even build the first space elevator in the solar system. The existing treaties will be rewritten in a new lunar society. The moon is a perfect sandbox to learn how to colonize the solar system. A perfect project to unify people, nations. If something tragic happens on the earth, yes, there is no doubt we need to colonize somewhere outside the planet, right? So why not the moon? Why can't we start right now? So let's rise together back to the moon and beyond through these Artemis missions. Thank you.